Hi, this will be uh, the second in my series on these overviews of uh, theoretical perspective in psychology. Not all of these six overviews or perspectives <laughs> are used today in the scientific field of psychology, but they are all used in some ways and by some people, as I also said in the other video. So as I said, in the other video, behavioral psychology, cognitive psychology, biological psychology and evolutionary psychology, they are used in the scientific field. And then psychoanalysis and humanistic psychology and stuff like that. That's more the philosophical field of psychology. So you read it to kind of try to understand deeper meanings, try to understand deeper conclusions, de deeper thought patterns. It's like I'm not religion religious, but if I read a religious book, it's because I want to understand deeper, deeper thoughts patterns, deeper morals, deeper concepts. So it's mostly used for that and also to explain basic premises of how we want to view humanity and premises we can use to um, earn money or maybe even premises we think can help people in some ways. Now I will go through all of these theoretical perspectives and uh, I will explain how they explain parts of psychology and how they think about psychology. Let's uh, take a simple example. For example, fear of snakes. Okay, we have a fear of snakes. Why do we have a fear of snakes? Is it even important to answer that question? And what kind of psychology can we use to um, to put some light on this question, to answer it. Let's say uh, we try to use only behavioral psychology to answer the question of why we have a fear of snakes. Well, behavioral psychologists, they would say it's like, a, it's just a stimulus response. So we must have learned it at some point because John B. Watson and others said that the mind was a blank slate. So we don't have anything in our, in our mind. It's just blank, completely blank. Everything we know, everything we learn is just stimulus response, even language. Someone says a word to you and you just remember it and then say it back. Okay? And they will say that, well, all fears must be learned from day one. So you learn to fear snakes and it doesn't matter what animal it is, you can still learn the fear. You can even learn to fear a cop or a screwdriver or grass or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just all stimulus response on a blank slate. That's also why John P. Watson said that he could take any person in the world and turn him into a doctor or turn him into a vagabond because we are all born exactly alike. We are just like sponges. So of course, for him, it's easier to say that because he was very, very successful and very famous. So maybe he wanted to tell himself that everything he achieved in life was because he worked hard at it and everyone could get to his position in life if they really tried. Maybe. What about psychoanalysis? How would they explain the fear of snakes and why we fear snakes? Well, uh, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, they will uh, talk about the unconscious mind and the mental disorders and early childhood, okay, as it says here. So most of our mental disorders and most of our fears and negative aspects of our personality were probably learned in our early childhood. Probably something to do with our sexuality because we are animal species, right? So we have a sexuality and we try to conquer stuff, we try to have sex, and we also try to destroy things we don't like or that compete with us. So very uh, animalistic thinking. And that also means that this fear is probably something sexual. Maybe uh, we use Freud concepts of uh, Oedipus complex. So uh, the snakes maybe symbolizes um, the father's penis, if it's a girl or woman. 
then maybe uh, Freud could tell her that, okay, you saw your father's penis when you were younger and then now you fear snakes because of that. Or maybe he could go, uh, go back to his dream psychology and say that, no, no, you probably just had a dream where you saw a big snake and now you fear snakes because you had that dream. So again, it's the hidden, hidden brain. It's something we cannot discover. It's something we cannot uncover. It's something his patients could not really tell him that was not true because he's just saying it's hidden aspects of the personality. And also very much learned. What about humanistic psychology? Now we have Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. They are very focused on the development of human beings and how we can grow as human beings. So the fear of snakes would probably be a bad thing because it's a fear. I don't actually I don't know exactly what they would say about fear of snakes, but I'm just trying to use their perspective. Probably something it would probably be something negative. To fear something, you need to grow, you need to overcome it, or maybe you just need to learn to accept it. You need to accept yourself, you need to become uh, full, uh, one with the environment, one with yourself, accept everything, be super happy, very, very positive. So you can use it to grow as a human being and also make sure it's not um, breaking your growth in any way. So that's what they will focus on. It's just something that that influences your growth as a human being. What about cognitive psychology? What would they say? Where now, now we are in the scientific area of psychology and in the advanced scientific area of psychology. This is not just behavioral psychology. We're not that simple here. This is cognitive psychology where we study the mind and how we process and store information so the fear of snakes will be probably something we learn. We can study small babies, we can study adults. We have much bigger studies here compared to behavioral psychology. We have a ton of uh, laboratory experiments. We have people going out and asking other people about fears and about snakes. So th this is much more modern psychology compared to behavioral psychology where we focus on animal studies and very small and simple experiments and they will probably explain the fear of snakes as just you know some cognitive processes and explain to us how it works how we start how we store the information of the snake how we remember the snake what colors are are the most fearful colors uh, how why do uh, no do we, when we see a snake stick do we fear it? yes because a stick is very similar to a snake stuff like that okay just how our mind works then we have biological psychology now biological psychology and cognitive psychology it's basically the same thing today because they are basically the same I mean they are they're using each other as a each other's findings and trying to create the best psychology we can ha we can have. So it's not like they're competing in any way because it's still the scientific area. And biological psychology would of course look at the brain centrums, they will look at brain modules, where's the fear centers, what happens if we remove a fear, some part of a monkey's brain, will it still fear? How does a monkey learn to fear? What do we learn to fear? stuff like that that's cognitive psychology but the uh, biological psychology would again look at the brain functions and see how they relate to all this cognitive psychology and these findings and mostly will actually stay in the chemical processes and how the the brain works and how the body responds to the emotions so mostly it will stay in the chemical processes but then cognitive um, psychology will of course use these findings and then we will have a bigger and more illuminative view of the fear concepts but still um, if you look at all of this and you are like me you probably find something that's really really wrong with all of this I don't know if you have discovered that but this is actually real scientific um, what 
perspectives in psychology. This is not just something I wrote. I mean, this is basically accepted history. This is what we went through. And what's missing here? There's not one of these directions that actually try to explain why we fear snakes. So nothing of this explains anything. It just illuminates what fear is. We just describe what fear is. The cognitive psychology study fear, biological psychology stu uh, study the brain, behavioral psychology study uh, simple fear and how we react to stimuli, and then psychoanalysis and humanistic psychology are just views that we can use in therapy against Carl Rogers and Sigmund Freud and uh, yeah these kind of people were about therapy about self-help and stuff like that at least Carl Rogers and Abraham was about self-help and then of course they're all about therapy and this part of psychology but none of them tried to explain why we fear and that's why we have evolutionary psychology this is very important to understand because, as I said in the other video, this is the foundation we have for all of modern psychology. It's a foundation that explains why we fear. And it says that if we fear snakes, it's probably something that has evolved. So it's probably an uh, instinct we have that solves problems. And maybe, not solve, maybe it doesn't solve problems in modern society, but it was evolved to solve a problem in a natural environment. So even though I, for example, live in Denmark and there are no dangerous snakes here, I can still learn to fear snakes very easily because I have these instincts that can be activated if the right environment occurs. Why is that? Of course, that's because I just have these instincts. That's what it is. And that's um, kind of the foundation that was very, very much lacking before. Because you can read a full book um, with cognitive psychology and biological psychology. I've done that many, many, many times. Read books on fear, read books on attraction, read books on love, read, I don't know, whatever. Uh, some of human emotion, hate, aggression. So you can read a full book on aggression, why, how people are aggressive what caused aggression, what kind of conditions can activate aggressions or make people calm. And then you reach the end, you close the book and you think to yourself, now know everything there is to know about aggression. But then you think to yourself, wait, no, I don't. I don't know why we are aggressive in the, on the first hand. So I knew I have read about these studies that look into aggression and study aggressive people but i actually don't know why they become aggressive because could it be possible that people could not feel aggression or could not be become aggressive well that's why we have evolutionary psychology because this is the direction that tries to explain why we have these behaviors not just look at the behaviors as we did before, but explain why we have them. Okay, I think I will um, go uh, through it very, very fast with a new idea, a new problem. Why are women attracted to tall men? So now I will explain it so, uh, again, so maybe it will become easier to understand. Why are women attracted to tall men? Behavioral psychology, again, it's a blank slate. So clearly they are attracted to tall men because something has happened. It's just a response to a stimuli. There's nothing more to it. We're not even, yeah, we, we, we don't have anything in our brain. We can learn anything. Psychoanalysis, women are attracted to tall men. Something with sexuality, right? So maybe small girls looked up to the father and when they look up at men, they see, they see something that reminds them of the father and then they get attracted to the man. Something like that. He doesn't explain why it's so. That's why evolutionary psychology is here. It explains why something can occur or not occur in human beings. He just says it's so. Doesn't make logical or evolutionary sense. Uh, just how it is. And humanistic psychology. 
well they would probably say that if you are happy with it then just be happy with it if it's a problem for you then maybe it's a bad thing maybe you should look at the best man instead of looking at the tallest man you should just um, try to work with it try to become the best woman you can be the best mother or the best wife that's what important to grow as a human being and to be happy again not answering why it is so just trying to kind of explain it away a bit or trying to use it in their foundation and cognitive psychology will just look will look at the mental processes we we'll also do some experiments maybe uh, go out and then try to ask people or maybe do some laboratory studies where you have tall men and short men or maybe uh, show women some photographs and try to make them rate the man on an attractive rate um, grade from 1 to 10 it's actually done so they, they will look at pictures and then they will say hey this man is that attractive that that man is that attractive stuff like that so we got the finding for how, how it works and cognitive psychology will try to answer the question is it so or is it not so that's what it answers not not more than that not why it is so but just is it so and how does it work in the brain and then biological psychology will again go in and try to um, support cognitive psychology and say yes yes it's all correct it works like this and this and this and this and this and now we reach evolutionary psychology where evolutionary psychologists will tell all of the other psychologists uh, at least cognitive and behavioral psychology that's still very much practiced today they will say yeah but didn't you think about the fact that there must be a reason that women are attracted to tall men and then cognitive psychologists will probably tell you that well i'm just studying it so i, I mean that's there can be a reason, there can be no reason, that it can be cultural, it can be biological, it doesn't really matter because I'm just starting the processes. And that's what many biological psychologists will also tell you. I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure it will be like that, but let's just imagine that to happen. They will just say, well, we're just studying the brain, it doesn't really matter. That's where evolutionary psychologists will try to give them many many more tools so they really can understand why we can be this way and then cognitive psychologists will have a lot of tools to predict behavior too and to also create a model of human behavior so we are creating the full model and we can finally write books about homo sapiens and not just single thought processes and we combine everything we can explain everything in a full subject called evolutionary psychology where everything else in the scientific field is part of it so now we are we are saying that the human is an animal and we have these processes in our brain because they help us in this and this way and women are probably attracted to tall men because tall men used to be as stronger than short men and back in the day it was really adventurous to uh, select a tall man or strong man because that tall man could beat off other men that would hurt your offspring and he could also um, catch more animals maybe because he's stronger and he could also protect the, uh, the family and the band from other bands so of course it was adventurous to mate with this tall man it was also adventurous to have his genes because then this offspring will also have the good genes that are tall and strong and then other women would want to mate with this kind of offspring so it again explains everything it creates a foundation for this kind of stuff I really hope this was kind of illuminating and I explained it in a good way even though I have an accent but I will try to make more videos to um, improve my uh, or to improve the explanations and also get more explanations on this kind of stuff okay thank you